Turn with me in your Bibles then to the first epistle of Peter. We continue our verse by verse study through this letter. Remember, Peter was writing to the persecuted saints in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, as it says in chapter 1, verse 1, which today covers over 300,000 square miles in modern-day Turkey. 1 Peter 3, 7, reading from the New Authorized Version, God's Holy Word. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, your wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife, as to the weaker vessel, and is being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Let's pray. Dearly Father, this is your holy word, authored by a human instrument through the moving of your Holy Spirit. It is inerrant, it is infallible, it is our rule and practice for life. God said it, that settles it, whether we believe it or not. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, now for your spirits filling, your spirits moving, brooding over us, and working in us. Engrave these truths on our minds, hearts, and our wills today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dale Davis, who is a Reformed pastor and was taught at Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, gives us a little insight into his character. And I think each of us, especially as I'm going to address the husbands today, we can also relate to. He says this, I was cleaning out and rearranging our storage room at the back of the carport. Houses in Mississippi normally do not have basements, so lacking a true garage, all extra items must go into the storage room. It was hot, sticky, and dirty in there. I had stuff all around on the floor, and whenever I'd turn around to pick something up, something else would fall down. I was right near the edge. And in my refined depravity, which I prefer to call my frustration, I was just daring and hoping that someone would speak to me so that I could vent. Ah, then I heard the female voice calling my name. That was my cue, and I didn't miss it. In a nasty, crabby dialect, I both growled and hollered, What? Imagine my surprise when I went out to the carport to find the voice of the nice Baptist lady who lived next door. Hmm. One can't lie, but the truth hurts. I had to admit, I thought it was my wife. I thought it was my wife calling me, which is even worse, a pure admission that I like to be nice to the neighbors, but I didn't mind crabbing at the dearest person in my life. What hurt the most, however, was the fact that I was exposed. My neighbor saw the real me. There was no place to hide. Friends, as I look at the Bible, I see it's God's revelation of he, who he is, but it's also a revelation to us, God's people. It's a revelation of us. When I look at the pericopes or these episodes in the Bible, I think of 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7, where we're in, and I think of verse 7 today, our text, and it gives the husbands here, myself included, a divine prescription for curbing our less than defined, our less than, excuse me, our less than refined depravity that we exhibit toward our wives. When we look on the theme, remember, of this section, 211 to 312, the theme is submission. Submission. The King James Version says subjection. It should read submission. Sub under mito to put her place, to put your place under the authority of another. That is active. You put yourself under the authority of another. Whereas subjection, sub acto, means sub under an acto to throw or cast. Somebody places you under the authority of the other. That's passive. In that context here, it is active. The word should be submissive, submit. That is the subject, the theme of 1 Peter 2.11 to 3.12. And remember, 
The persecuted believers here were called to submit to the unbelieving persecutors. First of all, as citizens, chapter 2, 11 through 17, and then in the workplace, chapter 2, 18 through 25, and then in the family, chapter 3, 1 through 7, and then in the church, 3, 8, and 9. And three of those four spheres, you might note there, are secular. Now the plan here, last week and this week, remember last week I addressed the wives. Why do, do you submit to your husband? And now what I'm going to do is address the husbands. And husband, do you honor your wife? And remember the context here. What we're dealing with here is in a Roman culture, Rome was the empire of the world of that day, and the wife here, the situation, is a believing wife with an unbelieving husband. You'll note verse 1 says again that even if some do not obey the truth. In other words, most of the husbands and the wives were believers. There were some, though, where you had a believing wife with an unbelieving husband. And in that culture, it was a very precarious situation because of the patria posteris, the father rules, the father's power. He had absolute authority in the family. And the woman was expected to be submissive and to follow the religion of the husband. And if she did not follow the religion of the husband, she was in direct violation of his authority. And in that culture, she would be subjected to very severe physical abuse. So that is why Peter is addressing this particularly acute situation. And you might know here, why are there, and the question I'm sure has arisen in your mind, as it did in mine, is why are there six verses directed to the wives and only one to the husband? Now husbands, <clears throat> curb your natural depravity. Admit that you with me had the little thought, just, just fleetingly go through your mind, that would say, well, that's obvious because the wife needs more correction. Not so. As Luther said, there's nothing easier than sinning, and that applies equally to both sexes. And I would add that with biblical headship, and the male, in 1 Corinthians 11, 3, when it says, who is the head of the man, Christ, and who's the head of the woman, the man, there's male headship, is that we have more accountability because of headship. We have more accountability and responsibility in the household and what goes on there than the wife. The real reasons why there are six verses directed to the wife and one to the husband, again, is because of the vulnerable situation that the wife was in in that culture a believing wife with an unbelieving husband. It was a very, very precarious situation. So Peter naturally, would, encouragement was necessary. So we would encourage these women. And also in light of the woman and the wife's inferiority in that culture, now in Christ, you see, they would have this newfound freedom. And because of that newfound freedom, of course, they would have to be reined in because that would pose problems on how that should be expressed. So enlightenment was necessary. Husbands, I'm going to take an unusual approach on this text today. I have read many different uh, preachers looking at this text, and I'm going to take an unusual approach today because I'm going to use the same points that I applied to the wife, I'm going to apply to the husband. And I'm going to deal then and put all of this addressed to us as husbands under the theme of submission. And I use as my uh, enlightenment, spirit enlightenment in that regard, Ephesians 5.21, that great text on marriage in Ephesians said, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. And you remember when I preached on that text a few weeks ago, is that the marriage should be looked at as a triangle with Christ or God at the peak of the triangle and the man and the woman on either corner. And the man, as he exercises his servant leadership, his headship, and he loves his wife, and the wife then submits to the other and respects, both do so under God, under Christ, submitting to the headship of Christ. The home can either be a little bit of heaven or a little bit of hell. And a lot of that depends on whether that husband and the wife are indeed committed to Christ, they're committed to his headship overall, and they submit to that. Husbands, you will honor your wife as God commands you only if you evidence submission both to Christ as Savior and Lord to his, and to his holy word, which includes 1 Peter 3.7.
My prayer for us this morning is that as husbands, the Holy Spirit would enlighten us as to the truth of this text, that we'd be able to discern it, and also for the Holy Spirit's filling, His controlling us to enable us to walk in its light and to carry out the mandates of this text. And may our wives bless God for blessing us as husbands in this regard. Husband, do you honor your wife? The first point is submission is an obligation. Submission is an obligation. Husbands, likewise. Stop right there. Homoios in the Greek. Husbands, likewise. Remember, look up at the beginning of verse 1. Wives, likewise. Homoios there. Same thing. And what that does is refer back. It means in the same manner, as, in the like manner as what? Chapter 2, verse 21 to 25 both the husband and wife are committed to submit to the example of Christ. Again, Ephesians 5.21, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Remember when we looked at 1 Peter 2.21. Look back at that verse. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example we should follow in his steps. In the Greek, the word for example means their sampler or pattern. Christ is a sample or a pattern. His life to us is a model life to follow. We're to walk in his footsteps, follow his pattern. And remember in the ancient Near East, in the first century there, when children and in, in the Greek and Roman world, when they were to learn their alphabet and their writing, they would do so by taking the copy paper and putting it over the example that they were to follow. And then they'd trace, trace that. And that's how they learn to write and they learn their alphabet. So Christ then is our sampler. He's our pattern on, and on how we are to live out that Christian life. And husband, I want to ask us to this morning, is that a passion in our lives? Is that a passion in our lives? That was a passion in the Apostle Paul's life, for example. In 1 Corinthians 4.16, he says, Therefore, be imitators of me. And in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, he says, Be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. Is that evident to our wives and our family? Does our wife say of us, My husband lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. Or my husband patterns his life after Jesus. Do our children say, my dad exemplifies Christ? Or do, my, or do our children say, when I look at my dad, I see Christ likeness? Husbands, that is our God-given responsibility before our wives and our children to pattern our lives after Christ. We are to follow Christ. That means forsaking everything to follow him, putting him first in all of life. A.W. Pink defined follow in Jesus as to commit ourselves unreservedly to him as both our Lord and Savior in doctrine and conduct. To commit ourselves unreservedly to him as our Lord and Savior in both doctrine and conduct. Husbands, as heads of our family, our family is to follow in our footsteps, and that should be as we follow in the Lord's footsteps. What an awesome responsibility and accountability we have. And our humble response should be Hebrews 6.3. This we will do, Lord willing. May God will it, permit it, enable us, strengthen us, guide us, direct us, and grace us to that end. And according to 1 Timothy 3, no man should be an elder, a leader in a church who fails in this regard, first of all, in his family. 1, Peter 3, or 1 Timothy 3, 4 and 5. The elder is one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Husband, do you honor your wife? The first point is submission is an obligation. Second point, submission is an opportunity. This is the central part of verse 7. Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Husbands here are given a threefold responsibility here as to their biblical headship, to be obedient to the God-ordained responsibility they have in relationship to their spouses. It's threefold. We're to be considerate, we're to be chivalrous, and we're to be a companion. We're to be considerate, be chivalrous, and be a companion. First, be considerate. 
the new authorized version that I, that I read from here, the New King James Version, says dwell with them with understanding. The NASB translation says live with them in an understanding way. I love the Phillips translation. I can well relate as a husband to J.B. Phillips. It says this, you husbands should try to understand the wives you live with. I won't say anything more. But I do recognize this. There's need for Holy Spirit guidance. There's need for wisdom from the Holy Spirit. There's need for discernment. And there's need for a true discerning judgment. The word here in the Greek, sonoikonantes, refers to living with someone in intimacy and cherishing them. Dwell together with them. Live with them in intimacy and also cherishing them them. And this means much more, husbands, than just having the same address. Dwelling together in marriage is both physical and spiritual. I bring you back again to the Roman culture, the Greek culture of that day, and the patria pastatus, again, the father's power. The wife was merely to care for the home and there for procreation. That was it. There was no uh, friendship, companionship between the wife. There was no concern for her rights. There was no concern for her physical, intellectual, emotional, spiritual needs, or anything. In contrast to that, the Christian marriage was revolutionary at that time as it is today. Keep your finger there in 1 Peter, and I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 3 through 5. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 3 through 5. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also to the wife her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And then also keep your finger there in the first Peter text yet in, in chapter 3 and then turn to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 to 28. Ephesians 5 25 to 28. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, so that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. Husbands, this takes time and it takes effort. And it's to be ongoing, a constant activity. You remember some years ago what happened with Charles Stanley. Charles Stanley is the Baptist minister down in Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia. And he has in touch ministries. And you remember uh, his, the wide span of his ministry over the years. And yet during this time period, what happened to him just when his ministry was flourishing, his wife was seeking to file for a divorce. And why? Why? Because he was being considerate to everybody else he was ministering to, and he was so wrapped up in his in-touch ministries with his preaching, teaching ministry, and to those he was counseling with in the church, he spent no time being considerate to his wife. And so she felt the need for separation and divorce. You know, what's interesting to me, I came across this last week, a study that was done a few, few years ago about the average husband and wife, how much time they actual spend, actually spend in communication with each other during the week. How much time does a husband and wife actually spend in, in communicating with each other during the week? You know what the study concluded? And this is the average, which means there's some, of course, way above, and there's some would be a lot less than this. 37 minutes. 37 minutes actual communication between a husband and wife during the week. 
No wonder marriages are falling apart when the children leave home. Because when the children leave home, you got two strangers looking at each other and they have nothing in common. I had a conversation just two nights ago with a 43-year-old man, wife and children, and I put this same thing back in and I asked him, how much do you think husband and wives communicate with each other during the week? And he's uh, not a believer. I've been praying for him and ministering to him. And when we talk, I try to interject whenever I can things of Christ. And then he told me about, after I gave him the answer, he, he told me about all of his friends that he, he knows. And he says, Ron, it is surprising that the friends that I have, the husband and wife, do not go to bed together at night. The husband and wife go to bed together, they're three, four hours apart. They both have jobs, they work outside the home, they don't eat together, they don't even have supper together, they don't have the same friends, they go in different directions when they do things. And he lives in suburbia, down in the Twin Cities. Think of how widespread that is. And then he told me that he and his life has worked hard to maintain communication with his wife. He had a job for years where he was away from home as much as a couple weeks at a time. But he said he made it an effort every day to talk with his wife on their cell phones for hours, literally hours. They'd set aside time together in the evening and talk. He said they go to bed together at night and they recap their day together and what each has done and what the kids have done and reported, etc., and all that. And he says it has been well worth it in their marriage because of those efforts. Studies have also been done. Do you know what the three main times when marriages fall apart? Three main times. The first one is in that first year or two. The first year or two. And we can understand that. You can think back, those of us that have been married, I've been married for 43 years. What you're doing is you're trying to establish a home, get your feet on the ground, you know, and you're, you're just working these three jobs and long hours and everything else, and the, the bills are piling up and the responsibilities and that. You've got to buy a car, you've got to rent a house and do this, that, whatever it is, and it's just, and the stress and the strain. I'll never forget, I was in the office, and there were two young people that I had that I had had as patients since they were in grade school. And they lived over in the Benson area somewhere, so you don't know them. And they'd grown up together, they'd gone to high school together and everything, they'd gone to college together out here at the, at the college here in, in Wilmer. And lo and behold, they were childhood sweethearts and they got married. They got married in May and divorced in July. And they came into the office separately and he had a, they had a restraining order on him where he couldn't come within 50 yards of her or whatever it was. And I looked at him, and then I also said the same thing to her when she came in, of course, separately later. I said, what did you expect when you said, I do? The love boat? Did you expect there was supposed to be bells and whistles and just dipsy dee doo dah through the tulips? Did you might incur to you that there was some responsibilities, that it might take work and effort to make this marriage work? And they both stared back at me like calves staring at a new gate. Never occurred to them. Just give me the divorce. The second time that's critical is that second, uh, is six, seven year mark. Now this is understandable. What happens is, you see, you've, you've got maybe a couple kids by now. You're on the road here on marriage. You know, the business is getting established. Your home is getting established. And the wife has her responsibilities during the day. You have your responsibilities. And, and you know, the, the husband looks at that wife. And you know what's happened? You know, the hips are starting to spread. She's put on quite a few pounds. And you know, with all the kids and the responsibilities, she gets out of the sack in the morning. You know, she just don't quite look too good. And you know that breath, you know, it'll sink a battleship in the morning. And, and you know that husband, you know, he just looks so harried and you know the hair is falling out, it's graying, and he just doesn't look quite that same dashing figure of the man I married. Six, seven years, critical time. And then the last one I've already stated is when the children leave home. The children leave home. If you don't communicate through all of those years when the children leave home, you got two strangers looking at each other and they say, who are you? You might as well have Alzheimer's, like my great-grandfather had, or my, excuse me, my grandfather had. 
And he looked at the wife of 50-some years and says, who is that woman with me? Husbands, the marriage that hangs together is the one that hangs out together. And that takes time and it takes effort. Secondly, this verse tells us, be chivalrous. Be chivalrous. It says here, giving honor to the wife is to the weaker vessel. Honor, teman, in the Greek means to respect her. Giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. Chivalrous, what's that? It's selfless gallantry. It's being a gentleman. It's showing generosity and courtesy to a woman. Kenneth Bailey, I've got a couple books of his on my shelf. He wrote Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes, Cultural Studies in the Gospel. And he is one that is great on giving the context in terms of a lot of the, the Bible material that there is in the New Testament. He taught over in a school over in Lebanon. He, he tells this story. The chivalry that surrounds women in Middle Eastern culture, he says, is striking. You don't see that in Western culture. And here's how it was witnessed to him really starkly. In situations of extreme danger, the women can do things that men dare not to do. And at the height of the Lebanese Civil War in 1975 to 1991, radical militias were kidnapping male Westerners. Teaching at a seminary in the center of Beirut, the time came when it was no longer safe for me to walk the four blocks to the seminary building. In order to survive, I imposed a house arrest on myself. And the militia that controlled our quarter granted permission for my students to come to the house for classes in our living room. For four months, I did not leave the house and avoided kidnap because my brave wife and daughter could come and go as they pleased. They could buy food. They could do banking, do whatever. And it was made possible then for us to survive. They were not under threat of being kidnapped. Why? Because traditional chivalry protected them. What does this mean here that the wife is the weaker vessel? The weaker vessel. What it does not mean, men, comparing yourself, husband, comparing yourself to your wife, it does not mean that she is inferior. Remember, that's the misdefinition of submission that's out there today. It means inferiority. It doesn't mean that at all, biblically. It means to put yourself under the authority of another. It does not mean that she's less intellectually, that she has a smaller brain, that she's less mental. It does not mean that she's less in character. It does not mean that she is less spiritual. Galatians 3.28, remember, our nature in Christ is the same. There's equality there, spiritual equality between the husband and the wife, the male and the female. So what does it mean? Surprise of surprises. It means that the wife as the female gender, has less physical strength than the husband of the male gender. Now, I know to our feminist culture, that may be a real surprise. I remember when my father, who worked on the railroad uh, for Burlington Northern for 42 years as a railroad engineer, I remember the day he announced that they no longer had linemen, they had line persons. So throwing the switches on those boxcars and all that, it wasn't the line man anymore, it was the line person because they hired women to do that. And he was just shaking his head because these were macho women, but they didn't have strength to throw the switch. You know, I don't see any women in the NFL going up against Steve Hutchins, that seven-time all-pro offensive guard of the Minnesota Vikings. You know, he's 6'7", 315 pounds. Remember that movie, G.I. Jane, starring Demi Moore? She played the part of that naval intelligence officer, Lieutenant Jordan O'Neill, and she was recruited to be the, the first woman trained for covert oper operations. The movie came out in 1997, and it was the number one box office hit. Ha! I remember that real men lambasted that movie as nothing but feminist trash. Well, feminists, they reveled in that. I only have one comment for that movie. Putting a hiney haircut on a woman and a military uniform on a woman does not obscure the difference 
the physical difference in strength between a man and a woman. The husband's, what's the husband's God-given response then in light of this? Well, as you might already assume, it's to protect his wife from harm. Remember the example I shared a couple weeks ago of my dental assistant I had that was in, had a fiance, and she was uh, just weeks away from her marriage. And they were on a county road in his uh, Z28 Camaro between Raymond and Clare City. And an 80-some-year-old man ran the stop sign, hit him broadside. And her fiancé, just instinctively, threw himself completely over her, went from the driver's side to her side, just threw himself over her. He was killed and she survived. That's what it means to protect the wife, the weaker vessel, to look out for her. And I know when I, I could have listed situations also in our military, when we have men and women on the front lines, that the men have that sense of protecting the women. I think of the example of Jesus. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. It says in John 15, 13. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That's what the husbands are to do. They give themselves up for the wife. They are to protect her. But it also means that they are to provide sacrificially for the wife to meet her needs. 1 Timothy 5.8, But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own household, he's denied the faith and he's worse than an infidel. Thirdly, our responsibility as heads of the household, as a husband, men, responsible to our wife is to be a companion, giving honor to the wife as being fellow heirs of the grace of life. The word there for honor is teman in the Greek. It means to show respect for the wife and by extension to all women. Why? Because the verse says, she is a joint heir in the grace of life. Grace, unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. 2 Timothy 1.9, he has chosen us and called us in Christ. It's all of grace that he saved us, not according to works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Grace, unmerited favor. What this does not mean does not mean eternal life. It does not mean in reference to children. What the grace of life has reference to here, husband, is marriage. Marriage, it's called the richest blessing in this life. Why? Because it's to be a picture of the relationship between Christ and his church, Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Husband giving honor to your wife means that you respect her feelings, her ideas, her thinking, her desires. She's a helpmate. Genesis 2, 18. She's to play an integral part in your decisions that you make as head of a household. She's the helpmate. Remember, Eve was taken from Adam's rib. She wasn't taken from his head to lord it over him. And she wasn't taken from his feet so that he could walk all over her. She's taken from his side, his rib, to come alongside, to be a, a helpmate. And the husband may not agree with his wife's feelings and ideas. As the head of the household, the buck stops with him. But he still respects her. It's always interesting to me, when you look at a marriage between a husband and a wife, how the marriages tend to balance. That God takes a husband's strengths and, and, uh, and then combines that with the wife's weaknesses, and then there's a blending there in that, and vice versa, and, and to see that in couples over time. I think that's a real grace of God. And husbands, may your marriage evidence that your wife next to Christ is your most prized possession. She's a companion. She is your richest blessing. And remember, with your sin nature that still remains, it's not automatic. And it's not going to be achieved by prayer alone. As Augustine said, you pray as if it all depended on God, but you work as if it all depends on you. It takes responsible, constant effort on your part with Holy Spirit filling and enabling. 
Husband, do you honor your wife? The first point, submission is an obligation. Second point, submission is an opportunity. And the third point, submission or not presents an option. Submission or not presents an option. The end of verse 7, that your prayers may not be hindered. Why does the husband honor his wife? By showing her the consideration, the chivalry, and the companionship. The end of that verse says, so that his prayers will not be hindered. Husband, how is your prayer life? Are you getting answers to prayer? Answer to prayer is the reward God promises to loving and caring husbands, godly heads who honor their wives, who live with their wives in the knowledge of God's word and will. The warning here is clear. If the husband's not fulfilling his marital responsibility as the godly head, his prayers will not be answered. Many verses come to mind. Think of Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. John 9, 31. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if a man be a worshiper of him and doeth his will, him he hears. In Isaiah 59, 2, or 1 and 2, the Lord's arm is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And James 4, 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss. This is a very serious threat at the end of this verse. Do you know what it means that your prayers be not hindered in the Greek? That your prayers be not hindered mean that they be not cut off. That they be not interrupted. It's, it's as if you were talking on the telephone to someone and all of a sudden the line went blank. The line went blank. Husband, how's your prayer life? How's it in private? Do you start each day with your devotion time with the Lord? Do you get out His Word and do you read and meditate on God's Word? And I'm not talking five minutes over some little quickie cereal bowl. I'm talking about quality time. Luther said the more responsibilities he had in the day, he'd get up two hours earlier so he could spend more time in God's Word and prayer. How's your private prayer life? How's your prayer time with your wife? Are you going in separate directions? Never the twain shall cross. You don't even have time for prayer with each other. That's why to me, meal times together are so important. Also, if you went to bed at the same time, important for prayer time. How's the prayer time with your family? I thank God that one commitment we made when our boys were growing up and they were in sports and everything else and all the kids' activities in school, that no matter what time they got home, is that we'd delay supper until they got home until we could all eat at the same time. I've often said to everybody, it doesn't make any difference in me. I start at 5 o'clock, just start eating, and whenever supper is there, I'll finish eating. John Newton said this, and I appreciate his honesty. He readily acknowledged the power of prayer, but he also readily admitted struggling with the practice of prayer. Here's what he said. I find in my own case my leanness and unfruitfulness is owing to an unaccountable backwardness to pray. Let me repeat that. He says, I find in my own case, my leanness and unfruitfulness is owing to an unaccountable backwardness to pray. And you know John Newton, he'd have a sermon text and then he'd write a hymn for the text. He wrote over 4,000 hymns. And in one of his hymns, he says this, I prize the privilege of prayer, but oh, what backwardness to pray. I feel its burden every day. I seek his will in all I do yet feel my own is working too. Friend, husbands, it's critical to a worthy walk in Christ that you and I need to honor our wives, that she is equal to us in this grace of life, that we need to have a worthy walk, we need to honor her if we're going to have answered prayer. Husbands, do you honor your wife? We've looked at three points this morning. Submission is an obligation. Submission is an opportunity. Submission or not presents an option.
What is a husband? I went to Webster's Dictionary. I thought it'd be interesting to find out what does Webster say a husband is? He said a husband is a master of a household. He's a manager. He's a steward of a house. He's a male partner in marriage. Husbands, I have a question for you. After our study this morning of 1 Peter 3, 7, is there anything that Webster missed? His master, manager, and steward are missing the qualifier in the Lord. He's also missing the term submission, submitting to one another in fear of the Lord. Submission, sub, under. Mete, to put her place, to place yourself under the authority of another. There's no mention of headship. 1 Corinthians 11.3 the head of man is Christ. The head of the woman is man. And there's no mention of being a servant. A servant leader. That's what agape love means. Christian love. Putting the welfare of the other above your own. Putting their interests first above your own. Think of the example of Jesus. Matthew 20, 28. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So my conclusion is Webster's Dictionary of a Husband comes woefully short of the biblical definition and of 1 Peter 3.7. I want to conclude this morning by giving us a couple examples of what it means to not honor a wife, to be disobedient to God and to 1 Peter 3, 7. I think of a friend that my dad had, an oral surgeon, very successful in business, had everything materially that a person could want. Beautiful wife, children, home, car, you name it. Then what happened is his wife got MS multiple sclerosis. She got worse and worse over the years. Finally, she was in a wheelchair. And it looked like in the future she would be bedridden. Charlie divorced his wife. He married his assistant. A blonde, good-looking young gal the age of his daughters. And now I want to give you an example of someone who truly honored their wife and was obedient to 1 Peter 3, 7. B.B. Warfield. Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield. Taught in a seminary, Princeton, Theology. World renowned theologian for almost 34 years until he died February 16, 1921. Many people are aware of his famous books like The Inspiration and Authority of the Bible. What most people don't know about Benjamin Warfield is this. In 1876, at the age of 25, he married Anne Pierce Kinkeed and he took a honeymoon in Germany. And during a fierce storm, his wife, Annie, was struck by lightning, and she was permanently paralyzed. Benjamin Warfield cared for her for 39 years, till he finally laid her to rest in 1915. And listen to this. Because of her extraordinary needs, Warfield seldom left his home for more than two hours at a time during all those years of marriage. On Romans 8, 28, God works all things together for good to those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. He said this, the fundamental thought is the universal government of God. All that comes to you is under his controlling hand. The secondary thought is the favor of God to those who love him. If he governs all, then nothing but good can befall those 
to whom he would do good. Though we are too weak to help ourselves and too blind to ask for what we need and can only groan in uninformed longings, he's the author in us of these very longings and he will so govern all things that we shall reap only good from all that befalls us. Husbands, be a Benjamin Warfield. Don't be that oral surgeon friend of my dad's. And I pray by the Spirit, his enabling and filling that we'd fulfill 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together the grace of life. And heed the warning that our prayers be not hindered. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your word of truth. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray for us as husbands, as heads of our households, the awesome responsibility and accountability you have given us. We know, Dear Heavenly Father, in and of ourselves, we will fail. We will sin. We will come short that we will not honor our wives as we should, that we will not dwell with them with understanding as we should, that we would not be the, the godly companions that we should be. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we would take heed to the very serious warning of 1 Peter 3, 7, that if we are disobedient to this, your truth, that our prayers will not be answered. I pray that we will have blessed marriages, marriages that picture the relationship of Christ with his church, that we will walk in your truth, that indeed, our wives will call us blessed. That they will glory in the godly husbands that they have. Because they obey.